Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tried and True, a podcast hosted by Delaware War Machine. I'm your host, Paul. I'm Dan. I'm Erica. We want to go ahead and take a moment to thank you, all of our listeners, for giving us your time and listening to this episode. We want to thank More Than Dice for giving us another platform to go share all the good stuff. And uh, we have lots of other great podcasts that are out there. You should go take a look at the show notes, especially considering the uh, guests that we have on the show this episode. And finally, thank you to all the patrons on Patreon uh, because your support, you've been able to help us out with this idea of this episode, which is the uh, table side conversations. So we're going to be putting up another little vote about our thoughts on Mark IV armies momentarily in in the future, so just keep an eye out on that. And if you want to go ahead and support us on Patreon, go ahead and take a look at the show notes. So how are you all doing? Everything good? Everything well? Lots of Diablo? Yeah, it's it's a new bug. It's infected Erica and Andy. (laughs) Yes, we are spending a lot of time in Sanctuary. Yeah, I'm I'm biting my tongue or whatever. I'm I'm going to buy this game. I just haven't yet. It's, it's an eventuality at this point. Watching the stream for a little bit, like I have no idea what is happening. There's just so many flashing <laughs> lights and just stuff. Yeah, there you go. That's Diablo. <laughs> That's the experience. That means, that means you're doing it right. Particle effects everywhere. Real fast, though. So current events of what's going on, if I... If catching this so privateer press is moving right they end up putting in an insider that i believe they're moving their headquarters to another location and because of that they are downsizing they're not going to need all their storeroom area and they end up having the legacy army final sale what were your thoughts about that the the reception of it personally i thought it was an eventuality we always knew that they were running low on stock of old models because they lost their capacity to make more on a large scale So when we heard that news back in, what, 2020, 2021, I had always thought that we're eventually going to get to the point where we can't purchase these old models anymore. I thought it was a smart move for them to let everybody know what models were going to be available in Prime Legacy. So I thought that was a good move. That way, you know, people could budget and select the models that they needed to complete their collections. Yeah, it was a a little bit like rushing there at the end, but I agree. The fact that they were able to go and list all the models that are going to be the new Prime armies, which is actually exciting. They talked about with Mage Hunters and Exalted that should be dropping later on this month. If not, the recording probably might already be out at this point. And then they showed the, what is it, the Krill Warriors and the Dark Operations. I think that's called the... the right, it's Cephalix, the right? Cephalix, right. And they have, what, what's the Crisis Caster? Is it Mort- Morty? right morton Ebra. Um, morton Ebra too yeah so that's that's cool i think i think she fits the vibe for that so i'm excited to go see them out there and at that point all the prime army should be there and uh, they'll be excited to finally have all that dust settle there and then all the unlimited releases from there yeah morton Ebra two is definitely squicky enough for that that army <laughs> And then I guess for the app, I think there have been more lore updates. Black Tide Season 2 just dropped, which, Erica, we actually had that battle report coming up that's going to be showcasing one of those scenarios. Yep. So depending on when this podcast episode releases, our, we're on episode 21 for a battle report. It's like, whoa. That is our next episode is actually features one of those narrative scenarios, which look like a lot of fun to play on. We did have to modify it a little bit. And our players do do discuss that in the episode. Yeah, it's a good one. So uh, make sure you make sure you don't miss it. Also, the season two of Black Tide now finally has the items in it for upgrading your command cards, upgrading your in faction character jack with different pieces as you go. And I'm really excited to crack that open and try and you know play around with that and see all the the neat custom stuff that you can do for these narrative chains of events here so what what we're planning on doing with dollar war machine at the end of the summer once you know things die down and after nova is actually starting up one of those leagues what is it resurrection league with those narrative rules so i think that'll be a lot of fun and that might actually be something that you know, we can talk about internally, maybe tracking our, our progress and lessons learned in case anybody else in the out there in the community wants to TO an event like this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be something. Hey, maybe we can put it up as like a free attachment on Patreon or something. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, like we did with our Journeyman League last year. That's right. Yeah. 
Now nah, that uh, that would be really good. I have to say though, because of the Black Tide season two, just playing that one narrative game, it was very nice. It was like a breath of fresh air, a, a palate cleanser. Did not do a steamroller to have an actual scenario that meant something, and it was a wonderful experience. And I mean, I was, I've been showing pictures of Dan. Him and I are going to be starting Black Tide season one, and we're going to be going through all those scenarios. So I'm really looking forward to throwing the lighthouse on the table and the little putt putt boats, and you know just having pretty tables fun little you know beer and pretzels machine and just going to town with that it, it's it it definitely felt different playing that game compared to like steamrollers i think it's just because it, it's it's it is a narrative event it's not supposed to be you know the, the winner take all kind of mentality with it yeah i agree we went to a day where maryland did several of the narrative events in a row and it was just a fun day. I mean, I lost like half my games, but I had a fun time just hanging around and rolling dice. And, you know, it was like the low stakes sort of thing. You know, it was just a, a fun experience going through the different narrative uh, pieces. And not only that, but it was a great uh, community building event for them as well. Not only did Maryland TO it, but everybody that was part of their community worked together to create these really cool uh, towers for the lighthouse, boats. So they... uh. Yeah, they their uh, their their narrative stuff came out really really nice. Yeah, they did a great job. It's good. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about the outline of this podcast. We're doing something a little bit different. So the patrons on Patreon ended up voting on a tableside conversations. And when we were first thinking about that, we were saying, okay, let's go talk to the people locally, see what the reception of Mark IV has been like, what are the things that they liked, what are the things we didn't really like. And it kind of opened outwards, and we looked towards other metas and other regions to go and see what the reception has been. So on this episode, we're going to be talking to, you know, individuals that are within our meta, but then we'll be, you know, talking to to others across the United States and then finishing up with some of the folks that are overseas. So with that, we'll go ahead and roll right into the interviews and we hope you enjoy them. Hello and welcome to our first round of interviews with our local players. On this segment, I'm going to be introducing the father and son duo of Jack and Chris. Jack and Chris, go ahead and say hello. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris. I've been playing since 2003, off and on, pretty much a lot in the beginning, but it died off when I had kids. And uh, I'm still painting and playing today. Hey, I'm Jack. I did a uh, battle report for the channel a while ago, going into Dwarves during Mark III. Uh, still playing Mark IV, still having a good time. Well, let's go ahead. You already talked about you playing, right? So, Chris, you started playing off and on during Mark 1, and Jack, I believe you were starting to play during Mark 3. What has your overall experience been with Mark 4? Or have you found that there have been some growing pains with it, or have you found some easy transitions? And either one of you want to take it away. So I've kind of found both instances of growing pains and transitions that were pretty easy, but mainly from a lore basis. I've been doing a lot of modeling and painting. Um, I've done Erica's Winter Core Army that's been on the channel. Right now I'm starting to paint her dusk. Uh, but I've kind of a little pain there was not seeing my faction represented, whether straight up in the future like Signar and Cador were, or as a reimagining sort of like Dusk House Callus. Um, I'm a protector player, so right now we're kind of left in the lurch. But uh, the easiest transition has been picking up the new storyline with the Orgoth invasion. I'm a very narrative guy. I like narrative play a lot. I played the Escalation campaign when Mark won. It was a lot of fun. But having all new characters, not having to worry about all the lore from the old characters, it's, it's a lot easier to pick up the story for myself and for new players as well, I'm sure. How about you, Jack? It was definitely new coming into it. Having only played for like, I think, nine months at that point, uh, Mark Three, But everything feels better. I have like my little technical issues, like blast damage still going through on misses. But uh, that's about it. Everything else I've been enjoying. There's some balancing stuff, but you know, that, that'll get worked out. I mean, my biggest thing has just been the structures. I think those still need some fine tuning. But uh, other than that, I'm enjoying the game, having fun building lists. Storm Legion is vastly overpowered, but what are you going to do? <laughs> I should say I I have had my games against Storm Legion and they are a tough nut to crack. That wolf feet is such a uh, pain in the side. What about mechanics? Because I know that with Mark IV they changed a lot of things for streamlining the game, making it faster, 
uh, what what have you found has been your favorite mechanic that has been implemented into Mark IV? It was weird going into it, but the new unit movement has been surprisingly fun because anytime you have any kind of like difference between that and like most things, it's just okay, move, place it into, then you're done, which just makes the game faster as well as you're not worried about uh, what do you call it, uh, command rages, which was annoying. So that's good as well as like. If you, ha I think there's a couple models with unpredictable movement where you place within four, so they feel cooler. As well as it uh, changes around some stuff. Like I know the Sentry Stone and Mannequins unit used to be a unit, but because of the new movement rules, they changed them all to be solos, which just kind of gives them a fresh new take on the battlefield. So yeah, I think that's been the most fun one to play around with. That's cool. Hey Chris, how about you? So like Jack, I tend to like the movement rules a lot as well. Um, I used to play a lot of Zealots, you know, with the Protectorate and dare a pain to move and maneuver around. I can only imagine how good they'd be now with the Mark IV rules. Leading from that, the blast damage is definitely a big plus. I know Jack's not a big fan, but I happen to love it. Having to worry about 10 templates scattered with scattered ice and having to worry about every single one is definitely a time drain during the clock. So I definitely like that. No, oh, that's good. I'm happy. I like not having any more widgets is very nice, but I, I find that I still have. I mean, we, we know you both have the Frozen Forge. Or I know Jackalese has the Frozen Forge widget. So, I mean, it's it's less widgets, but you still have plenty of acrylic on the table. Oh, yeah. So, hey, Chris, how has your experience been painting with the models? Because I, I want to ask is that some of the models do have art done for it or painting done for it. So you have a good idea on what is metal, what is leather, at least for my Orgoth. But I just recently painted up the Forge Master and there's just the 3D rendering of it. So I kind of had to figure out, you know, what should have been what color. What has your experience been with painting the models? Has it been refreshing? Is it a bit of a challenge? Like, wh what is your thoughts on that? The answer to both of those is yes. <laughs> I like the fact that everything's so detailed, everything's so separate. You know where to begin and end whatever details you want to paint. I did feel your pain painting a lot of the Winter Corps army because... There were a lot of 3D renders and not a lot of art, except for that one splash with forests and everybody in the forest. So, but um, it's it's been it's been great. I like how the paint sticks to this new re this resin they use. The newer resin they just came out with is even better, I think, holding the paint. You know, I pick. You know, how sometimes you pick up models and the the paint or the base coat or the undercoat will rub off. It doesn't do that with these so from my experience so far. They've been a blast. I've had a lot of fun. No, that's good. And how are you painting your stuff? Are you doing like traditional painting? Are you doing slap chop like with speed paints? Like what have you been experimenting with? I've been experimenting lately with a lot of the speed paints. I find that doing a zenithal highlight over a gray undercoat has been very helpful with the speed paints to pick out those details and have the highlights in the right places. I think the speed paints are a lot better than leather and cloth than a lot of the solid paints, traditional paints are. That's just my opinion. It definitely fit, you can paint them faster that way. But uh, I think just the way it, the dull, duller look it has definitely lends itself well to both those textures, the leather and cloth specifically. But I use a lot of P3 paints, solid paints for, for stuff. But I generally don't go traditional except for my protectorate. Erica has a wonderful imagination and has had me do the winter course sort of like the fifth border legion with a little twist but uh the dusk she just picked out a really cool theme almost looks like iron man but there's enough difference to it where it's not completely like it <laughs> it's just funny when we end up posting that online and just like i can't unsee it now like it's because it's, it's like the, it's supposed to be like a sunset kind of color but it's like that shiny red with gold i'm like yeah that that's iron man <laughs> yeah I, I, and god bless her because she's like i don't care i love it i'm like great because everyone else can't unsee that picture now <laughs> it's so true all right. Hey, Jack. So I want to ask you a question. And this one's kind of a little bit more close to home, right? Because I'm a teacher, right? And you're a high school student. So we're just, you know, different school districts at this point. What with war gaming, right? Whether it's War Machine or war games in general, how do you think is the best way to expose this game to a younger generation? I'm not like saying like elementary kids or stuff like that. I mean, like, like high schoolers, like what, how do you think maybe they say like, Ooh, I got some disposable income and I'm interested in going and buying a kit of models and, you know, hanging out with other nerds at a shop. Honestly, the best options are social media, like TikTok, Instagram, stuff like that. If you can maybe drum a following there, that's a good place to get it going. Other than that, it's kind of hard because Dungeons and Dragons is still picking up steam in high school and like it's much more popular and accepted than it was previously 
but it's still difficult to like sell that to new people. Even beyond that, it's just like, hey, you want to sink a couple hundred dollars into this game? Ha- yeah, yeah, ton, ton of rules, ton of rules. <laughs> but uh, I mean, so it's just kind of difficult in general. But I think if you're if you're in a school, it's good to like talk to friends about it. Maybe like try and get like a school club together and then like get that figured out. No, it's actually interesting you mentioned about school club because I had one of my students uh, end up asking because he's a Warhammer 40k player and I was telling him about all the stuff that we're making for Nova and he said, you know, it'd be it'd be nice if we had like a, a tabletop wargaming club and really like I, I, I was noodling on it because I'm also doing esports as well. But I think it'd be really neat if high schools would look into this because there's lots of like not just like war machine or warhammer right you have like historical war games as well that i think even like history teachers could use as like a way to explain like wars potentially if they end up having like some kind of military history aspect to it but no uh no i think that's all the questions so did you guys have anything you wanted to go ahead and share not necessarily i'm just excited to see what armies are coming out later this year well, i want to see more brian blood more uh chimera and definitely waiting for this quote-unquote secret thing they're revealing at Gen Con. I think it's Vinter, but we'll see if I'm right or wrong. I'm still holding out that, you know, you're talking about your protectorate, though. I mean, right the, right now, the, the big uh, the big murmurs is dinosaurs, right? Love dinos. Dinosaurs would definitely get more people into the game, in my opinion. <laughs> it's, it's what everybody ends up saying. Uh, Jack, anything you want to say? Uh, no, that's about it. <laughs> Fire dinos. Very excited. <laughs> no, it's all good. All right, cool. Well, you know, guys, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you at the shop. And Jack, I know you're probably going through finals week at this point. So, you know, enjoy the summer. I'll see you guys. See ya. Thanks, Paul. See you later. Hello, everyone. Erica here with our next guest for the special interview episode. Welcoming to the podcast for the first time is our local Convergence player and Dungeon Master extraordinaire, Tears. Howdy, howdy. <laughs> hey, Tears. So for those of you who watch our battle reports, uh, you may recognize Tears from a recent Mark IV battle report. Tears, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, we're so excited to get your take as a new player to the game of War Machine in Mark IV. But before we get started with the questions, could you take a moment and introduce yourself to our listeners and give them a quick snapshot of your tabletop background? Sure. I uh, so I'm Tears. I'm a professional dungeon master, and I've been playing tabletop RPGs since 2012, and probably DMing for about that long. In terms of tabletop war games, War Machine is actually the first one I got into. I, way back in 2014, purchased uh, my first War Machine bits during Mark II and had no one to play with at the time and didn't actually start playing until Mark IV. So I'm, I'm weird in that I have had my models since Mark II, but have not actually gotten in until Mark IV. But I'm loving it. <laughs> that's awesome. And then you found us on YouTube, right? And that's how you kind of linked up with with our AU meta. Good old tried and true. I found out that you guys were called Delaware War Machine and I was like, holy crap, I'm like 45 minutes away from Delaware. This might work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we're super glad to have you, Vinny. And we have a new player, right? Who just picked up a signal box. My buddy Alex, yeah. Yep, yep. So we're growing, we're growing. Okay, so uh, we're just going to get into a couple questions here. So Tears as a new player to War Machine and Mark IV, we're just, again, we're so excited to get your perspective as, a, you know, a newer player. So let's just dive right into these questions. Mm-hmm. So on the subject of a new player, as a new player to War Machine and Mark IV, what are your overall thoughts of the edition so far? I like it a lot. I'm aware of previous rules in Mark II and Mark III, things like the shots that miss being diffracted off in a random direction, things like uh, the way sprays worked with the template and the AOE templates in general, and the changes that Mark IV has made that I'm aware of uh, all seem to be about streamlining play, so it's less time at the table arguing over semantics and more time spent having fun and playing the game. That I appreciate a lot about Mark IV, and because the rules are more streamlined and a little simpler, I think that also bodes well for onboarding new people, because when you find a game you like, the next thing you want to do is find people who want to play it with you, and if you don't have any, you know, not everyone's lucky enough to have tried and true 45 minutes away from where they live, so getting friends in to the game is easier, I think, when they have, when the game itself is a little easier to grasp. 
So when you said that War Machine was your first tabletop war game, like what initially drew you to it? Was it like the aesthetically? Did you like the the world of the Iron Kingdoms? Like what was the big draw for you? Or does the little man's just look cool? I had a buddy who was really into it back in 2012, tried to get me into it. And at the time I just was like, nah, I don't have the time or money for something like this. You know, thinking like war games, I thought it would be this huge investment. It ends up not being the case. And uh, down the line, when I actually bought the, uh, <laughs> in 2014, when I bought the models, the same friend who was super into it had already sold his models off and moved on to another game. What drew me to War, Ma- War Machine specifically was, partially was the aesthetic, definitely was the lore. I really loved the lore. Not that, you know, Warhammer doesn't have lore too, but War Machines, I thought, felt so fresh, so unique. The fact that it has a space for, you know, cyberpunk, not cyberpunk, sorry, Tesla punk, as well as diesel punk, as <laughs> well as steampunk it's all kind of rolled into one in a way that is kind of cohesive i really love the uh the setting and frankly i think the game design is a little bit better than warhammer sorry warhammer fans yeah that's fair that's fair i also uh play me some gw games and war machine just scratches that that itch so i feel you on that one uh okay so as a newer player what are your favorite war machine community events and why do you like them the most This is a two-part answer. The first thing I love the most for community events is just weekly play. The fact that there's a location where everyone gathers every week to get a game in or two. That's huge. It builds community. It's consistency. It lets you practice new things. And it's low stakes. It's not a super intensive competitive scene necessarily. It's just a place to come and play with your friends and hang out and make new friends. But in terms of like events events, not just like meeting up and playing weekly at the game shop, I love the team rollers. I love the team rollers so much. Grabbing a buddy or two and uh, being on a team to compete is just a ton of fun. I've always been more of a cooperation versus competition person personally. And the idea of going in and like cooperating tactically with friends as opposed to just me versus everyone always felt good. Yeah, I think... uh team like team machine it's the format i enjoy war machine the most too and having that camaraderie and i feel like too when when you're on a team like you were saying before it's less intimidating where it's like you went to the broker brawl for your first time a couple months ago and i think you had a good time right (laughs) oh i had a great time i went four and oh (laughs) yeah four losses zero wins (laughs) <laughs> uh, but hey, it's the memories along the way. But um, it was great memories, great fun. Good. So, what do you think are the biggest hurdles or struggles for new players, and what recommendations do you have for community organizers to grow a local meta? I think there's a couple different things. I think one of them, you've got one group of people who are potential players who are players of other tabletop war games or tabletop strategy games. And a lot of them fall privy to the sunk cost fallacy where they're like, oh, well, I've dumped this amount of money into this particular game, so I can't switch games now, you know? And that's just not true. You can always sell off stuff if your old game doesn't have anyone playing it anymore and use that money to invest in the new stuff. Also, the new stuff isn't all that expensive. Also, We've got a great community of people with tons of armies between us, and any of us would be happy to lend an army to an interested new player if they wanted to try something out. The other big hurdle, I think, probably is finding that local community. I'm lucky enough to be 45 minutes away from Delaware, so Delaware War Machine is like, you know, my home, my happy place. But I know there might be more remote parts in larger America where there aren't active metas to join, and that could be tricky. The answer to that, I think, is playing online with a virtual war game tabletop. Okay, nice, nice. All right, so Tears, do you have any other, you know, final thoughts or things that, like, as a, as a new player, you just kind of want to put out there for, for the masses? Not to, you know, be repeating Bill and Ted too much, but be excellent to each other. I think the strongest thing of this particular, not just this meta, but the strongest part about the community of War Machine is how the community treats each other and itself. It's a fun game to play, we all know that already, but it's a huge difference when it's also fun to be with the people that are playing it. That's my recommendation, just be excellent to each other. <laughs> so before before we go, Tears, we, you know, we gotta do that Nova plug. So for those that don't know, Tears is the professional DM, right? That's correct. Uh, is hosting some Iron Kingdoms rpgs at nova so tears do you mind just taking a minute or two and sharing what you got cooking up yeah i'm working on so it's an ik rpg fi- uh, fifth edition dungeons and dragons setting and i don't want to give away too many secrets but it is going to be 
there's going to be a little bit of puzzle solving, there's going to be a little bit of exploration and role play, social interaction, and there's going to be some combat. Deadly, deadly combat. We'll see. The goal here is not to uh, kill all my players, because that's no fun. As a DM, my approach is always to try and tell the best story I can with the people I'm playing with. So if you want to have a fun tabletop RPG sesh, look me up at Nova. I'm going, I think, five of the days, four-hour sessions. Yeah, I think you're there all week with yeah, us. Yeah, I think I'm there all week. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about Nova. Yeah, so uh, again, Tears, thank you so much for, for coming on and hosting those events at Nova with us. And we're just, we're, we're so happy to have, have you and the Jersey crew uh, hanging out with us on Tuesday night. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thanks again for coming on and we'll uh, check out that next uh, that next interview. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next segment of our Tableside Conversations. Now, getting away from the local players, we're actually going to start talking to some players who play uh, nationally at this point. So my first guest for here is going to be Ryan from Blightbringers. Ryan, go ahead and say hello. Hello, everybody. It is happy to be here. I don't have to do all the audio work for once, so this is nice. <laughs> so what have you been up to since Boca Brawl? I mean, it's only been like two months like now at this point, but, but what's been going on? So I have mostly been practice. well, yeah, practicing for WTC because we obviously, you know, winning the Brawl, we got a spot on team for that. So it's been figuring out the logistics of European travel, which I have never done before. I've been trying to learn Dusk, uh, which is a really big shift for me. I am very unused to the focus mechanic, how all of that works. Like, conceptually, I understand it, but it's like a very different thing to conceptually understand how a thing works and actually be able to put it on the table and make it work. So that's been a fun learning experience. Also just been doing a lot of painting has been fun because i've been enjoying this a lot more than i usually do well let's actually kind of ask a couple of questions because again we're kind of doing this table side conversations with with players for people who are not aware of where do you actually play out of and can you kind of describe your meta sure i play out of buffalo new york it is let's see i think we've got six or seven people right now that are playing regularly we had more you know uh, previously but a bunch of people uh, had kids and started families, as well as, you know, the usual kind of disenchantment with Mark IV. So we lost a couple people to that, and I'm hoping they'll come back. But right now they're taking a break. Let's see, I've got basically everyone in my meta except for me plays multiple factions. So it's really not hard to get like a specific game in to, you know, one thing or another if you want to. Um, I know there are multiple people that have specifically... Signar, Legion, Circle, and Crix now. So like getting into any of them, there's multiple people who can do it. We've also got, you know, people who just mainline certain things like Cody, who was uh, playing with me at Boker, uh, is mainlining Infernals right now. I think Andy, who was also at Boker, is trying new Signar. Rick has jumped onto new Kador. So like we've got a good mix of both older factions, the legacy stuff, as well as people jumping on to the newer factions, and it makes it, you know, really kind of easy and nice to get a game. For a while, Canada had events going. I don't know if they still are. Getting across a border after COVID is still a little difficult, or it can be, um, but we used to travel up there relatively often to get games in, um, and I'm hoping that's a thing we can restart doing relatively soon as well. Gotcha. Okay. And then how about... Because you mentioned that some of the people were disenchanted with the changes to Mark IV. I guess, like, what were your overall thoughts of Mark IV when it ended up coming out? And it, it kind of a two-part question is that when we went to Boker, I'm assuming that that was maybe your first large-scale experience of a Mark IV event. Like, how did you think that went for it being Mark IV and everybody kind of being on board with playing the game that way? So my initial impressions were... <sighs> It was the, I guess, normal nervousness you get with any new addition, any change, you know, any big shift in the rules always, especially if you've been playing for a while, always causes at least a moment of like, okay, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Is this going to be any good? You know, it's the normal questioning of what is going on and why. 
once I got past that and actually started playing a couple games and reading the rules and really getting into it, realistically, it's not a ton of changes from Mark III. Uh, once you get into it, a lot of the stuff is just kind of streamlined a little bit. It makes a lot more sense. The only thing I really had a problem with, and really the only thing I still kind of have a problem with, is the movement rules for units. It just it feels so silly to do it that way, and then, you know, the effects that come off of that. Like, a, a good example, um, I played into Sorsha 3 on Tuesday, and her feat specifically says if a, a model or a unit were to go through one of her clouds, it takes a point, and then because everything else places after that, it would also take a point if that one model that moved going through her clouds did. So a single wound infantry cannot go through her clouds at all, they will just die. Makes perfect sense. Until you look at, we had like burning earth clouds on the table, they don't say that. So one guy walks through and gets lit on fire and the rest of the unit pops through and is completely fine. And that just was one of those moments of this feels kind of silly and that probably isn't how that should work, but unfortunately it is, so you just kind of roll with it. So my initial impressions were, you know, a little bit of skepticism mixed, I think, with a healthy amount of salt, and then it's gotten a little bit better. I still, I'm not a fan of some of these rules, and I'm hoping they get cleaned up. But as for, like, Bo Kerr, you're, yeah, it was my first real Mark IV event. Um, it was, it was actually really, really nice to see so many people show up and go, you know what, maybe this isn't Mark III, maybe I can't use, you know, anything and everything under the sun in my faction, maybe this isn't going to be, you know, the the ideal beatdown list that I would have had, you know, even six months ago, but I'm going to try it and I'm going to have fun, and it, it was, it was, you know, Boker is a great event, it was a great weekend, it was a lot of fun, and it was great to see, instead of the kind of negativity you get when, you know, like the trash cord or Facebook sometimes, to just get people that are like, this is fun, I'm going to go and I'm going to have fun, let's roll. And, you know, you still got some of the normal salt that you get at these events of people being like, oh yeah, my dice died, or this unit is stupid, this, this ruling is stupid, I can't believe this happened. But for the most part, it was a lot of positivity. It was a lot of people just going and having fun and being like, we're going to try this. We're going to do it with alcohol. We're going to do it with good friends. And it, it was a great time. Are there any other large scale events aside from WTC that you're trying to attend as well? I mean, in an ideal world, there would be several. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out European travel is a bit more expensive than I thought it would be. <laughs> I don't know how many, if any, I will be able to get to. Um, I know... There are some people talking about going to, I'm going to mispronounce this terribly, the Sas Sasquahana Shuffle? Yeah, the, the Sussy Scuff. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's one of ours. <laughs> oh, is it? Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of people are talking about maybe going down to that. We might be able to get, you know, two teams to go, but a lot of that depends on you, how much it's going to cost for, you know, the event itself, how much it's going to cost for maybe a hotel for the night, if we're just going to drive down and drive back exactly what's going on there so i think that would probably be the only other bigger event i want to try and if i can drive to a couple steamrollers in the semi-local area and you know hit that way just to get some games into different things into different metas into different play styles instead of constantly playing against the same couple people uh especially when you're you know trying to practice for wtc where you're gonna go to europe and play into people that you've never you know, played before, their play style is going to be very different. The things that they think are going to be important in a list are going to be very different, and it's going to be trying to account for all of that in your own list building, in your own prep. It's going to be wild, so I want to get as much practice into different things and different people and different ways of playing things as I can before we get there so that I'm not caught completely on the back foot. Gotcha. Well, I wanted to go back to one point that you made earlier, because you talked about with Boker and you don't get to play with all the rules that you want to go and play with. What was your reception to Unlimited being a format? And like, what is your thoughts on it being adopted? like overall by different communities because we're like talking about like Falsier is not going to be you know in prime but i'm going to want to go put her on the table but who else is going to want to experience that right so my general thought process on unlimited is that it's probably still if not a necessity it's a good thing to have there's going to be enough things that aren't in prime and models that people already own that they're going to want to play and especially with privateer coming out recently and saying hey you know, all of the legacy armies were not producing them anymore. 
So whatever is out there is all that's out there, and then maybe they'll get revisited at some point to get like a Mark IV army, but that's not a guarantee. So, you know, for like me, who has almost full FA of Legion, I might not be playing that so much uh, super competitively anymore, but like, it's definitely nice to be able to say, oh, you know, I can go back and play you know, Abby too, who was my first caster, or one of my first casters, and get her on the table again when I want to. And I'm really hoping that the community as a whole doesn't do what it says it's going to and doesn't kind of just go to, well, Prime is all that matters, so that's all we're going to do. That's all we're going to talk about. That's all we're going to think about. That's all we're going to play. Like, that's great if all you're going to do is hardcore competitive and, like, traveling to conventions, and that's that's the only thing that matters all the time. But I think having the option for both new people in your meta to be like, hey, they're not making circle anymore but if you really like these things you can play them and you can play whatever you want and let's get games in anytime you want i think it's a great tool for that especially since people are going to want to get rid of armies and you can pick them up relatively cheap because the resale value is not terribly high uh, and being able to either get somebody to buy in with a legacy army relatively cheap to learn the game and just play the things that they like and if they want to move on to something else, they can. But also it helps with, you know, situations like mine where I have full FA of a faction. I don't need to have full FA anymore. When you drop from 10-man units of, like, small base infantry to 5-man units, I have three boxes of Legionnaires. I don't need three boxes of Legionnaires anymore. I need one and a half, maybe. So, like, I can give the other one and a half away and be like, oh, hey, you like these? Cool. Here you go. You're going to play now. And having an outlet for stuff like that, I think, is really nice. So I think Unlimited is like a needed thing, and I'm glad that they're doing it. I hope that Privateer supports it for a while, and I hope that the community as a whole recognizes it for what it is and uses it as both a tool to like get people into the game and their local meta and beyond, but also just to play your old favorites and go back and say, you know what, every game doesn't need to be hyper-competitive, we're practicing for WTC, or I need to be you know, on the next metal list before anybody else. Like, you can just play a game with the models you like and the things you think are fun, and that's perfectly okay and valid. Yeah, I, uh, it, it kind of cut me, cut me deep when you were mentioning about having full FA for your Legion, because I had full FA for Rhett, so when I saw that, you know, Sentinels, it's like, okay, FA2, and it's like five-man units, like, well, it's a whole unit of Sentinels that are going to be shelved, and whole unit of invictors that are going to be shelved and yeah i i can go on and on about the disappointment of it i'm a little i i want to i want to be as good as you in giving away my models to people who want it i know we actually have one guy who just started picking up brett stuff i i don't know if there's ever going to be a system where it's like what what is it called unearth or unprimed or whatever it was called oh, like when it was like like larger point values yeah. basically you double the fa of everything so i'm i'm kind of holding off for seeing if something like that ends up happening i mean, I mean maybe but like again it's it's uh, it's kind of a value thing right so if you've got you know two or three units of sentinels and you can only use a unit and a half of them now are you 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 know unless they have sentimental value unless there's something else there for you in which case by all means like do your things hold on to them but like if you've got a brand new person who's like hey i really like rat but you know maybe they're in high school or they have a situation where they just can't spend a bunch of money on it are you going to feel bad about being like you know what here's a box of sentinels that i'm probably never going to use again like this will help get you into the hobby this will get you showing up this will, if nothing else, like, you'll make a friend out of it. Oh man, that's so nice. That that that, that That's like a Disney moment right there. Right? Get the birds in here. <laughs> so, I guess, what are you most looking forward to, I guess, going forward? And, like, what are you looking forward to? What are your local players, like, most looking forward to? Is it unlimited for you, or are you just... Are you waiting for Chimera? Because I know like that's like the next step in the Legion. Like, well, what's, <laughs> what's, what's on the horizon for you? So, I'm super hyped for Chimera. Honestly, I already kind of talked to Nate about it, and we both had said, hey, so October, we're both going to be just talking about this nonstop and figuring it out, right? And he's just like, yep, like, no doubt, that, like, me and you, we're going we're gonna to do this. I'm super hyped for them, and, you know, what comes out of that. I know somebody on the Discord the other day had brought up that uh, some of the new Chimera stuff is actually in the most recent D&D &D book they put out, Borders and Beyond. Oh, cool. They, they mention them, um, so there's a little bit of fluff in there about you know the chimera and the, specifically the war beasts so it's super cool to see that 
that's my hype right now. It was first WTC because, you know, first time getting to go, first time getting to travel to, like, you know, such a big stage to play a game. Um, you know, first time going to Europe. Uh, my girlfriend is coming with me, so, like, we're going to spend a little extra time over there and, like, make it a proper mini vacation. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to, like, getting to play, like I said, on such just, like, a big stage and such an esteemed event. But beyond that, you know, Chimera looks awesome. I'm excited to see... Uh, when they bring out Colossals and Gargantuans, what they look like and how the rules for them work. Any excuse to get the Archangel back on the table, let's go. <laughs> the The local meta is, I think, in a very similar boat. There are people that are waiting for new factions. There are people that are waiting for the release of the rest of the Brine Blood stuff. And they're very excited about that. Um, I've got, you know, one or two people besides myself that are very excited for Chimera. And they are thinking that, okay, if the rules are any good at all... The models look cool, so, like, they are going to jump back in. They haven't played for a bit. Uh, so, you know, getting people that hadn't played and were a little skeptical back on the game is super nice. And then just really getting to play more games, getting to just sit down again and, you know, do the, okay, this is a hobby. I'm doing the things that I like. I'm going to do it with people that I like. Let's go. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to look at it. And, you know, I didn't say it earlier, but congrats on making the WTC team. It's, like, such a, like, great thing, and I'm really, like, happy for you to go and had that experience oh thanks uh, I'm, I'm glad you're going to be able to have that experience it, yeah, it, it's wonderful me too uh, I'm, I'm glad i can afford it <laughs> the one vacation of a year the, the one tournament literally this is my one vacation for the year i did not have enough time off work to do anything else so like i had to cancel my other vacation to be able to do this no but i mean like it's cool like it, it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity i know we have a couple of folks from the american teams that i guess go every year or they go multiple times i I mean, I can only, you know, they, they have like the, the, the jerseys from all the previous years. Right. But what I get at, though, I think it's neat when you have new blood going in to an event like that. Whether like, you know, doing your damnedest, like, you know, best in order to go and play the matches. But just but just being able to see like this game on an international level, I just think it's a very humbling experience because you know we know that war machine isn't as big as it was back in the mark ii days and, and such but it's still neat to see that there's still like thriving metas located around worldwide that still you know absolutely love this game oh for sure and like i had said it's also it's kind of like a big deal for me and that's why i've watched wtc on previous years was just to see what people value in lists what they value in taking because like you or me might look at you know a list and say oh well, it needs to have two heavies, and it needs to have a blast out, and it needs to have a stealth out, because, you know, the the Northeast meta is notorious for, you know, Signar and needing to have something to deal with stealth. But then, you know, you go over to Europe, and suddenly those things aren't valued anymore, because those things aren't as big there. So, yeah, okay, maybe you have, a, you know, a minor out for stealth, or like, oh yeah, I've got Hex Blast, so that'll be fine. So suddenly your list that you run locally, that you're just like, oh yeah, I'm stacking armor to 27 all the time, are just wrecking people's face because they're they're not prepared for it. That's an entirely different way of playing the game. And the same thing, the things you value, maybe you shouldn't value as much because you're going to go to, you know, something like this where suddenly, oh yeah, I can drop armor 27 and everybody just looks at you and says, cool, people do that all the time. Like, I've got an eight point damage swing. Your armor means nothing to me. And you're just like, huh, well, this is different. For last question... Anything else that's going on that you want to go talk about? Yeah, if you want to go give a plug-in for Blightbringers, anything like that, like the floor is yours, you let us know. Oh man, putting me on the spot. So check out Blightbringers if you haven't. Um, we appreciate all of our listeners. Well, Nate does. I usually just make fun of you guys for listening to us. Sorry, not sorry. And then uh, the Boker broadcast uh, that Seth and Art do, check that out. It's a good listen, and they are good people who are usually right about things. I question Art's decisions on pizza, but like... <laughs> from new york city what does he really know it's fine I think really that's it i don't really have a lot to plug unfortunately Just play more games do fun stuff post it online i like seeing it i couldn't agree anymore well ryan thank you so much for joining us in this little uh segment on tableside conversations really do hope that you make your way to the susquehanna scuffle it'd be nice to be able to see you get another game in yeah man it, like you know wishing you the best of luck with wtc and everything else going forward Thanks very much. Uh, if I do go down there, uh, we need a rematch, and you need to be nicer to me. Uh, we will see. I've actually been playing Orgoth right now a lot, and I'm just I'm I'm trying to understand how to like play this army effectively and and stuff. So you know, we'll 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 see how that match ends up going. 
It's really easy. You put Kishtar on the table and you murder Caster's turn two. I don't, I don't want to play her. Like, it's <laughs> funny because, like, I look at her and I, I love range Warcasters and I love guns, but I just look at her and I'm like, I don't want to. Like, and actually, I play her incorrectly. I play her with the chainsaw heavies. I just, like, chainsaw and, like, crit shred for days. Like, to me, that's way more fun. I mean, I, I would appreciate seeing that more than just getting shot off the table turn twos. I'm in. <laughs> I, I support right, this cool. decision. <laughs> All right, well, Ryan, thanks again for joining us. And with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next interview. Thanks so much for having me. I have another guest with me on our podcast today, and why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Dave. I'm from Las Vegas here, trying to uh, get our meta back together. I think a lot of us are trying to do the same thing. So, Dave, what's your history with War Machine? Uh, I've been playing War Machine since, like, the very beginning of the Oblivion campaign. I went into one of my local stores back in Colorado. I actually saw a bunch of Colossals on the table for Menoth, and immediately was like, oh, what is that? And here I am. Yeah, those big models really do draw you in. And what's something that people might not know about you? Uh, well, I am a union electrician, and I try and play as much as I can in my free time. I do a lot of painting, too. Uh, I have a Instagram and, <clears throat> excuse me, an Instagram, stuff like that set up, and a TikTok as well, which has got, actually gotten a little bit of traction, surprisingly enough. <laughs> I don't even know what TikTok is, honestly. Do you ever, uh, with your electrician skills, do you ever wire up a miniature and have like glowing stuff inside of it and all that cool things or stay away from that sort of thing? I actually do have a couple that I've lit and a couple that I'm planning on lighting up. I saw a Scar 3 on the Facebook group that was lit from the bottom. So all the souls were lit green and I really want to do that to mine as well. I think I saw that one too. That seemed like a great miniature. So let me ask you this. How has your overall experience been with Mark IV? Since I know that you said you started approximately around Oblivion, which is like the tail end of Mark III. What what have you felt about the new edition? I think it's really nice. There's a lot of people who don't like the movement and stuff like that, but I think it's perfect. I I think that it's been readjusted to the point to where it's accessible, and the switch from Mark III to Mark IV has been great. I have no issues with it. It's been easy to pick up, easy to learn. The game's faster. It just flows better than it did, even that little bit, the year or so that I played of Mark III. Okay. Um, what Out of all the changes, what do you think has been your, your biggest uh, growing pain so far? Kind of a split, I guess. The, the movement was kind of rough at first to learn how to actually keep the tactics in play when you're moving up, having to brick in with two inches and all that. And then AoEs were a really big learning, uh, learning experience for me because now that AoEs don't drift or anything like that, the auto-hitting stuff, I, I've gotten so many of my high-defense stealth low arm models just ripped off the board because of that (laughs) yeah a lot of people do have that issue as well it's less felt in kator not a lot of the stuff is too dodgy (laughs) on my side of the table (laughs) so i know that you said you first saw manoth models what is your favorite army to play my favorite army to play is probably still signar so when i saw the manoth models i went and went immediately went over the shelf and they had the old two-player battle box with crix and signar in it I picked that up and I played a little bit of Crix and then immediately fell in love with Signar. And they are probably my primary army. I keep coming back to them no matter where I drift off to. But a close second is definitely Menoth. I actually took them to LVO this year. Oh, that's cool. What what other faction that you don't play would you say kind of makes you consistently jealous and why? Oh, geez. That's a hard question. I would say as far as mechanics go, probably... Legion, just because they have so many good things that they can do that makes life so much easier for them. Yeah, they do love breaking the rules, don't they? (laughs) And as far as, like, aesthetics go, I think, honestly, I really do like Kator a lot. I love my big stonky boys and the red paint job, you know? Yeah. It's like my my candy-colored sports car. (laughs) (laughs) Right? I did a, I painted a couple in, like, a uh, olive gunmetal green that came out really nice. I really like that scheme, too. Uh, like the drab military feel yeah 
Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about your community out there in Las Vegas. I'm excited to find out more about how you guys run things and how it's different from how we do things over here. You know, I know that you said you're trying to rebuild during the pandemic. Are there any specific challenges you've had to overcome over the last couple of years that are unique to your region or the area around Las Vegas? I don't think there's been anything really unique per se as far as challenges that we've run into. Vegas is large enough that we have like two communities almost. There's two major game stores here and there's been trying to get the two stores together is kind of a challenge. There was a little bit that we started to kind of build the fence back or build the bridge I guess would be a better term and it just COVID and everything spooled up and it kind of tore everything apart. And then Mark IV came out, and that created an even bigger divide because there was a bunch of people poo-pooing it a little bit. And so we ran into those issues. The the rebuilding, we've been fortunate in having the core of our community at our game store is really into the game. There's a lot of love for the game. There was a little bit of disparity with everyone's favorite faction not being out at first, but we were actually starting to kind of get back to where we were uh, we did lose one of our wtc players he moved back out to uh, your guys' neck of the woods actually he went back home but we had two wtc players in our store which helped a lot too oh i think i might know that guy is that a one mr brad park that was a one mr brad park yep yeah he's been a uh, longtime community member for sure so i'm curious about these uh, two different stores that you've got are they like uh, dueling metas so to speak do you uh, are you like poaching players from one store or the other uh, not really. Uh, the other store has kind of gone dormant as far as their player base. They've all kind of moved on to different things. I'm trying to kind of get things going again. I'm posted in our Vegas Facebook, like, hey, if you guys want to come out and play demo games, play something you haven't played, I probably have the army. We can try and get together and do something. And my local store, we've been, it, it's kind of like two bubbles. It's weird, but things are slowly getting better. That's really great. I'm glad to hear that. So this might sound like a strange question, but Las Vegas is uniquely a gaming city, right? There's all these casinos around and craps being what it is, rolling 2d6. Uh, I'm curious to know if there any of that like casino culture clashes with or spills over into War Machine or your uh, our type of gaming. Surprisingly, not really. Other than people collect dice like mad out here. Lots of, <laughs> lots of casino dice on the tables. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but, you, but you really don't see a lot of the the crossover there. Uh, even, you know, like in craps, there's a certain way to hold the dice. You don't even see that. And there, it doesn't blend well, I guess. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, you probably go into a game store instead of a casino to, to get away from all that, right? Yeah. I mean, I work in the casinos most of the time, and it's it's nice not to have to listen to people cheering and all the hustle and bustle. Yes. Yeah. Those places get real loud, don't they? So what style, I know that you said you try to hook people up with, with armies or, or get them demos whenever you can, but of the, of your like established players, what style of play is popular in your area? Do you find pl players will run a lot of gun lines or melee centric armies, etc.? Uh, our meta is actually really nice in a way where we have a ton of different play styles. We've got one player that really loves gun lines. We've got one player that loves 120 millimeter bases. That's all he wants to play is he wants big stompy, just completely roll all the way over you. And he's our scoring player too, which is kind of funny. I really like gun lines personally. I play a lot of those. Even within Signar, I liked Haley 3, Haley 2. But I did actually play Cray and Mark 3. I didn't go swimmingly, but I played him. And then we have, uh, in Mark III, our other WTC player was a circle player, and he liked to play super fast, board control, you know, Kruger II, he played Morvana, and he, with Morvana there was just nothing you could really do because of the recursion. So we have a, a very wide net, so it makes it really nice for getting ready for tournaments and stuff like that, because at least one of our players is probably playing something that somebody else is playing that might be coming to said tournament. So you ha you can get some well-rounded practice. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm consistently struggling to try and get games into some some different factions because, you know, like in our area, we have maybe like six troll players and no scorn, you know, like it's really very strange, honestly. The trolls are real popular over here. Yeah, 
they're fantastic. I I really like trolls too. Yeah, <laughs> and and those are like always touted as like the hobby miniatures. You know, if you if you love to paint, you should play trolls. <laughs> There's yeah. so much detail in those sculpts. Oh, absolutely. And they're they're not super complicated to paint either. Well, unless you go for the tartans. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> so looking for the looking towards the future, what are you and your community excited about and hoping to see in the game in Mark IV? Or if not see it in the game, see something from the rest of the community or from Privateer Press? Uh, we're all really excited to see what the new announced Mark IV factions turn out to. We want to see what Chimera is actually going to be. I know we have a few people that are really interested in Brine Bloods, minus the the only the only catch I keep getting is a little segue, sorry. The Brine Blood, the troll, their main heavy, uh, everyone says it looks like he's playing dress up because all the hats and everything like that. But <laughs> Isn't that the isn't that what you want though? You want to play dress up with your little dolls. Right, yeah, it's like the it's like the the paper dolls, yeah. Yep. I love the mixing and matching. I think it's great. Me too. I think I think it's it's just comical enough to make it like interesting, like, oh, what is that? But not to the point where like, oh, that's kinda silly. Yeah, I mean if we're starting off where we're bashing people with a shark, I can't wait to see where we go from there. <laughs> the sky is the limit at that point, I think. That's right. <laughs> So what do you think that your group does as kind of like part of your community that that helps bring people into your store or, you know, just refresh the community or get new players, that sort of thing? We're all very good at talking to people. We're all not shy about it to where if somebody comes up and says, hey, what are you doing? We're like, hey, this is War Machine. This is what we're doing. This is this. This is this. It's a skirmish game. You know, yada, yada. We go through the whole spiel. Everybody's really good at that. And... I've been working, my 3D printer's been working pretty hard trying to get some 3D terrain set up to where we can have one or two tables of 3D terrain. Kind of stealing your guys' idea that 3D terrain catches the eye, it brings people in, they want to see it. And so I've been doing that. We've been playing with guard towers, even if we're just using them as an obstruction, we've been putting them on the table because they look so good. And that gets people that come in to play Magic or the other tabletop war game that shall not be named you know any of that stuff they come over and they want to see what we're doing yeah i i totally agree with you there you you, you got to get that curb appeal you know what i mean absolutely do you think there's anything that you've seen another group do that you'd like to try and incorporate into your strategy i really like the it's all really i mean the east coast you guys are probably the busiest and then up there in northern washington is probably the busiest just from what i can gather from social media i really like the fact that the the drive to put events together i think that is key you know because we figure here in vegas we attract a lot of the southern california meta uh, we have gotten some of the folks from washington down here as well and a few people from colorado that i know have come over for events and stuff mainly like las vegas opens and whatnot but if we could drive more events here i think that would help a lot because i mean a lot of the socal stuff is only three hours away and that's really not much in the grand scheme of everything and tucson is six hours away which is a little bit more of a poke but it's not it's not terrible if you're going to come spend a weekend up here yeah everything's real spread out there i agree just getting events on your calendar is a great way to drive interest that and making it regular too can be very helpful like a monthly steamroller it's always going to be like the second saturday of the month or whatever and that can really make people regularly predict your events and make a point of coming out to them exactly and I, i'm hoping that maybe once a little bit of the first little bit of summer cools off we can get a steamroller going and and try and make that regular i i too really like that idea uh, I wish you luck. I hope you. I hope you're able to pull that off. So, anything else you want to throw at us? Any uh, special interest topics or anything close to your heart? Um, I mean, I'm glad that everyone nationwide is starting to kind of come back together and starting to play the game again. And it, we are slowly starting to feel that here. And I appreciate everybody for opening their their minds a little bit to what Mark IV is. And about all I can say is, don't knock it before you try you try it because it's actually a, a definite leap in the right direction, even if it is a little rough on certain spots here and there. Couldn't have said it better myself. Give it time to breathe. And, you know, trust the community and trust Privateer Press, and we'll be, we'll be playing a, a banger of a game before long. 
Exactly. Uh, no time flat. I think beginning of next year is going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. I can't wait for all the new armies and everything. What a world we live in, huh? Yeah. All right, Dave, anything else you want to add? Any uh, content or events that you want to pitch to us or, you know, the rest of our listeners? Uh, I know that we're trying to put together our Strange Bedfellows qualifier for September. That is still up in the air. Hopefully I'll be able to get some more details for that here before too long. Completely like not guaranteed, unfortunately, at this point in time. Other than that, you know, that's that's about all I got. Look for my painting. I love just feedback on the Facebook groups and whatnot. And I'm, I'm easy to find. It's just, just under Dave. Just Dave. That's right. And we can find you on Facebook, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, I post a lot on the Facebook groups and stuff like that. It's, uh, Dave Roth is my last name. So I'm in. I'm in, I'm pretty active in all the Facebook groups as far as the general discussion, the painting, all that stuff. So that's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on today, Dave. And hey, everybody out there that's listening, if you are interested in War Machine in the Las Vegas area, send Dave a message. Try to get involved. See if you can go to one of those steamrollers you're setting up. Absolutely. We'll, we Any skill level, we don't care. We'll teach or you can borrow whatever you need. We'd love to have you. That's awesome. Hello, everyone. In this interview, we have Matt from Moment of Clarity out of Warsaw, Poland. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing fine. How about you, Erica? Doing well, doing well. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us this this evening or afternoon or whatever time of the day it happens to be. It's actually evening, but it's happy to share this time. <laughs> so diving right into it, we're uh, again, part of this episode, we're just reaching out to other metas and wargaming communities and seeing how the Mark IV transition has been. So on that note, how has been your overall experience in Mark IV? And what have you found to be the most growing pains of this transition? And what's been the easiest? Yeah, I've been playing War Machine since Mark I. And when I started playing Mark IV, there have been a lot of pains for me. But uh, to be honest, the most painful was to distinguish pistol between gunfighter. And I still catch myself messing those two. I'm the same way. So like my easy hack for that is, is the picture of the little pistol on the man or on the weapon? Yeah. And that's how... <laughs> okay, awesome. And what are you most excited about with the new edition? I'm most excited as a community builder that the new edition will be more compact. There will be less models to one army and... Since I've been running demo games since uh, Mark 1, I s saw uh, it as a uh, trouble to get new players into War Machine when there was hundreds of models to one army and the player had to buy all of those models to s uh, get into the game. And right now, with all those armies getting really small amount of boxes, I'm really positive and excited uh, about growing the community, growing the War Machine in my, my area, because it will be much easier for us to advertise the game and convince players to start War Machine. So speaking of Mark 1, could you just let us all know a really quick history for you and the game? Like, when did you get started and how did you meet your community? I started playing, I think I was 13 at the time, or 14, and uh, at the moment I'm playing uh, War Machine more than I wasn't playing <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and we've had uh, this shop that was a distributor in Poland, and they made a really cool project, League, don't know how to really uh, call it, but mm -hmm. they gave us starters, starter boxes, and they said that if we learn the rules, we pass the rules exam, we put those miniatures together and paint them, we are getting this starter box for half the price. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and there was a really big boom for War Machine in Warsaw at that time. I got into War Machine, I was in junior high school at the time, I had a lot of time and yeah, <laughs> got hooked into the game. And <laughs> uh, Cool. Yeah, played... Uh, through all the editions so far. Nice. All right. So, what what's the buzz in Warsaw? Like, what are the most popular armies people are playing right now? Are you finding it's mostly Legacy, or are you seeing a lot of Mark IV stuff coming out? Right now, I see mostly Legacy armies because there is lack of availability of new models. But it's uh, getting better over time, 
and I'm uh, sure we will see more those uh, new armies because all those new players coming into the game are getting Mark IV armies even though there is big uh, second-hand market they are all deciding to go for the Mark IV armies because uh, it's safe for them that they will be able to play them over the course of the whole Mark IV. Yeah, as for myself, I really also got excited with Orgot Army, Sea Riders, mm -hmm. and uh, just finishing painting it and will be rocking it here in uh, our local meta. So with talking about community building, uh, before we started recording, you were telling me a little bit about these uh, academies that you guys are starting. Could you give us a little bit more detail on that and what that all encompasses? Yeah, in uh, local stores here in Warsaw, it's, uh, this kind of event, they're calling academies. And it looks like uh, this, uh, that the stores are advertising it in their social medias, that they're running this new game, Academy. And we're giving them some information about the game and some photos, pictures of our armies to hook players into coming to this academy. Before we start playing the game, we just gather everyone around. We talk a little bit about the history of War Machine. We're giving some quick overview of the lore in War Machine. And very quickly, we are talking about the rules. And then we are pairing players and their trainers, mentors that will be guiding them through their first game. And we always try to have uh, one person teaching players the game at one table. So there is two players playing the game, learning the game and one person looking at the game and teaching them how to play War Machine. We are trying to bring as many of our legacy armies to let the players choose from, so they can just pick what they like visually. It's also our uh, rule that we are only bringing uh, painted and based models, right? To make the players enjoy this academy. In the end, we are all, always making the group photo to show later that War Machine and this uh, whole system we are advertising isn't that that it players are interested in learning and we also try to always uh, point those players who come to the academy to join our discord server to be in touch with them to try to help them with building their first rosters to at the moment telling them where they can uh, get the models etc Oh, that's that's really awesome. Congratulations. You said your one of your first events was really well attended, right? It was uh, not the first one. It's uh, it was uh, I think third one, but yes, it was uh, 16 new players showing up and learning core machine and we were really surprised. And from those uh, 16, I think some already got their starter boxes, so I hope really they will show to the first 30 point tournament soon. Oh, that's awesome. Big congrats to you guys and your, your growing community. Thanks a lot. That's always so exciting. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much for all of the uh, great Mark IV information. It sounds like the, the game's off to a good start over there in, uh, in Warsaw. Could, do you mind just sharing where, you know, where our listeners can find you guys, can find your games or your podcasts? You can find our podcast uh, typing Moment of Clarity in Google, uh, Facebook, and if you are around here in Poland, Warsaw, we have a Facebook fan page, War Machine and Hordes Polska, where you can just type and we will uh, give you some directions to our Discord server where we can set up for a game. All right, sounds good. We'll also add a moment of Clary's information in the show notes below. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks again. Yeah, of course. Thanks again, Matt, for coming on and sharing your time with us. And on behalf of Delaware War Machine, uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll bump into you guys at some point. Do uh, you guys have anyone going to WTC this year? Of course. Okay. We, we'll Are miss you, you next year. We'll be there next year. We're coming next year. Okay. So see you next year. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in 2024. All right. Have a good one. Thanks a lot.
Thanks, everyone, and welcome to another segment that we got as part of this podcast. And with me on this portion of the cast, I have a very special guest. This is a brand new War Machine player who is new to the area, new to the meta, plays out of Australia. You've probably never heard of him before, but if you play him in a game, make sure you go easy on him. Uh, Chris, how you doing? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my first time on a podcast. Yeah, you know, it's it's, uh, it's a wild ride. Had to clap or something before it. It, it was very strange. <laughs> yeah, this newfound technology of recording things over the internet. I know, right? Not just hitting the record button on Skype and going at it. <laughs> <laughs> Gone are the days when we'd fly to other countries to interview people, I guess. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Well, hi, my name's Chris. As Dan mentioned, I am in fact a new player, or at least I was a while back. <laughs> yeah, so I guess if you've ever heard of someone called Active Player, I don't know who he is, but he sounds a bit like me, so there you go. <laughs> the last time that particular line worked of I'm a new player, please go easy on me was when I accidentally, well, when I sort of crashed a WTC stream <laughs> and the casters didn't, well, one of the casters was Doug. I'm pretty sure he was well aware of me. The other caster had never really seen War Machine. He's like, oh, it's your first WTC. How are you going? How do you find it? I'm like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I remember listening to that cast, actually. And I was like, Chris, no, what are you doing to them? <laughs> that line is not meant to work. That's the, like the bait line. We have a laugh and then we move on with our lives. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, yep, I've been playing for I don't know how many years at this point, actually. Like 15, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I legitimately forget. I've been basically playing Kadal for most of it. I really just play two factions, Cardor and factions I pretend I'm playing when in reality I'm just playing Cardor or, or waiting for releases. We call that opposition research. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Or, I mean, sometimes it's like, <laughs> well, I remember when it was COVID times, I played a bunch of like strange bedfellows for an online league. This is like, look, I really should play something different and there's no excuse when it's War Table. And, you know, some of this stuff looks fun. It was very fun. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have a couple questions for you today. Um, we're going to focus on you know your experiences with your local gaming community and uh, how that may be the same or different from some of the experiences that we have here in the United States. Yeah, fair enough. So I'm going to hit you with a quick couple rapid fire questions and then we'll dig in a little bit deeper after that. Yep. Sounds good. So overall, how's your experience been with Mark IV so far? Honestly, it's been pretty good, but mostly like, look, all right, I'm going to roll this back. Game-wise, actually really good. Uh, there's like a bit, few quirks, honestly, a lot with regards to the unit movement system. But it's the kind of like, like it will get sorted out in post. Realistically, especially in Australia, I mean, you got to ship containers through like choke points of jellyfish and spiders and all the other fun Australian wildlife. <laughs> and that, I guess, has been the main issue for me. But in terms of the actual game itself... It's been fantastic. I've been quite a lot enjoying it, both. I really like how they've actually given a damn about the old stuff to make it fun in a different way, or even just fun, period. Like, it isn't just they're like, okay, we're just going to slap some stats on these models and go to town. They've, especially with the newest stuff they coming, they've been coming out, and the fact they're basically going to keep trying to upgrade and edit, like improve the older models, That's that's got a big plus in my book. Yeah, I agree. I'm interested to see a lot more of the innovation and uh, changes that they they add, like these new twists to things here and there. What do you think has been your favorite change so far? In terms of Mark IV factions, I'm going to say it's the uh, rack system. You ever have those games where you're just like, why does this cast have this dead fucking spell? I don't need it. It's not relevant in this matchup. Like, what am I doing with my life? This kind of avoids that. Allows you to basically tailor stuff for the matchup. So a lot of your lists have become, like, by extension, a lot more flexible. And that would probably be my favorite change. The other would be just command cards. I think it's just a pretty elegant solve for a problem that's existed for a while. If you've ever played Menoth back in the day, especially way back in the day, like, say, Mark II or so, you remember it's just like, you have no Pathfinder. There's no Pathfinder in Jax. You need Errants. That's like, Errants and Idrians are like your two sources of Pathfinder, and that's it. Well, you don't have to... It allows you to soft counter things, uh, which I quite appreciate. I think also it's a good space to change things up. We've already seen that actually with defenses, like how people have started slotting in, like, say, Sapper, even if they're already running defenses... 
because it only helps them against their opponent's defenses that they bring any, but in the event that their stuff gets in the way, it's like, okay, boom, it's gone. Well, now this wall that was going to previously block the charge, it looks like it's just gone. Oh, sh**. Look at that. <laughs> Got caught out again. So modularity, really, I guess, is like your favorite thing here. Yeah, I'd say so. You know, the, the ability to mix and match on the fly and interact with the game in a different way now. Yeah. I also think that the game itself, like, War Machine, I think, as a game, has always had interesting units. Like, this isn't just, like, Spaceman with gun of various different flavors. Is it a genetically engineered Spaceman? A dwarf Spaceman? Super genetically engineered golden Spaceman? I like the fact that they actually make a lot of the stuff interesting. It's hit or miss, I'll be honest. Like, a lot of times they go, like, this is what the unit is conceptually designed. Like, yeah, it kind of doesn't work. But I appreciate the effort. And a lot of the stuff that does work, it feels good to play. Yeah, sometimes they release something, you're like, hmm, I have some notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I always think, like, if I could be a fly on the wall in those conversations, like, if I could just hear what they wanted it to do, I might have a better idea of, of what I'm trying to do with it. Yeah. I mean, also, yeah, I was just going to say, like, it sometimes it's like, you know, not every unit has to be top tier, absolutely competitive. A lot of times it's like, well, this unit is a good conceptual idea and it's actually fantastic, but it doesn't make sense in meta right now due to what we're seeing i think an easy example of that actually is like those signal storm thrower guys the lightning bolt like unit like conceptually cool and you take the old unit attachment sorry weapon attachment of the storm blades you make it a whole unit and you make it like function it's fantastic it just kind of doesn't work right now because the things you want to barbecue and fry with lightning are lightning resistant these days <laughs> whoops <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of Australia, I'm really interested to find out more about, you know, what your experience with War Machine has been like in that area. I know that things are down there are a lot more spread out than they are here in the United States. We have yeah. like tiny little pockets here and there where different players will, will come to, usually around a big city or, or neighborhood. But I gather the experience is much different for you. Yeah, that's more or less correct. So for Australia, just quick geography lesson. Australia is mostly focused around its capital cities, but the country is the size of a United States continental America. It's massive. So, for instance, there's, like, people playing in Perth. They might as well live... Well, they basically live in the equivalent of California, but there's nothing really in between. It's like no one's playing it in the mining camps in the desert. <laughs> so... Yeah, it means that, like, you get these little pockets that form, but as a result of that, because of the distance, especially if people are in, like, isolated areas, a lot of people will play with War Table. Like, I play with guys from Brisbane from time to time, and if I, or I'm watching and just spectating their games, it's just going to be over War Table, but that's okay. Like, that definitely came more to the forefront with COVID, I'm going to say, because it was just like, well, we're all stuck in here, so, you know, there's only really one way to get games in, so that was good. For whatever reason, Australia just has a very competitive meta, and I wouldn't really be able to point you why. I think it's, like, a lot of players come into War Machine with, like, backgrounds from other games. Hell, like, I came in from Warhammer Fantasy. That was like, literally the reason I ended up playing War Machine, was I played card games for a while, was coming back in, and was like, oh, remember Warhammer Fantasy? That was kind of fun. And I asked my friends, and they were all getting out. So I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to jump into something else then. I, I do hear that a lot from people that they ended up with fantasy around that time that got killed off and they were looking for a new game and yep. War Machine was there to pick them up. So yeah, I mean, pretty much ultimately a good thing for our community, right? Yeah. So you guys run the Dark Guidance podcast, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, how, how have you guys been able to kind of push for more games like in person around you? Do you guys have gaming clubs that you go to? Like I know the, uh, the British guys usually rent like a hall or something that they go to. But what about you? Yeah, actually a similar setup, but it's been kind of recent, honestly. There is a gaming club in Sydney. I live in Sydney, as do a bunch of my other friends. Yeah, we basically go to the games club, like, we have a preset day and we try and get in and just play. Alternately, also, it used to be we were running a lot more tournaments, but that's kind of slacked off, not, like, realistically, a lot of people are waiting for more stuff to come out for Mark Four, and I can't blame them because I've been running, I've been wanting to myself. But yeah, that's how we've been, like, trying to get games in, actively focusing on it. And it just grows slowly and steadily. I would obviously prefer more, but I also, um, like, a lot of the people there are great people. Because the kind of people who, like, get into the game and stay in the game, a lot of times motivated, fun to talk to. And it's always good fun to just talk shop in person. It was one of those things I actually found 
you don't re- appreciate until it's gone. And especially during COVID, that was one thing that went away. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know, we're all playing on like whatever anyway. We're all busy. And then it was like after a few months, man, I just really miss meetup games. <laughs> I really do. What? Can I get some? Yeah, I I totally agree. I, I love War Table for the tool that it, it allows us to use, but there's really nothing like you know playing in person. So to me that's that's what really you know gets it for me so it's it's good to hear that you're you're trying to put places together where people can meet up the community ultimately is is why i play this game right i'm never going to remember all the dice rolls individually but but the friends that i make along the way is the magic Nah, a hundred percent did i just quote my little pony i don't I don't know what's going on anymore. I ain't haven't watched it, and I'm just going to assume that, no, you said something inspirational, and we are going to move on with our lives. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one, you're the weirdo who brought up My Little Pony. <laughs> Fair enough. Moving on. Let's talk about the uh, types of players or games that you happen to see in your area, because I'm kind of interested in how different players across the world play different things or different styles. So what kind of armies or play style do you typically see in your area? Do people run a lot of infantry or a lot of warjacks or play more for like attrition focused or assassination? That sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to say it's probably in general in Australia, it's a lot more attrition based at this juncture. A lot of the more wacky lists that people came up with for assassination, it isn't that they don't exist. It's that a lot of people sort of worked around it. Even if there is an assassination threat, it's usually part parcel with the actual list itself. So, for instance, an easy example would be Sabrath. You can run a perfectly fine Sabrath list, which, you know, you're playing the long game, but in the event your opponent gives you the chance to just perdition and get a red-lined heavy onto your caster, then you go for it. You, know, you preferably go for it in a way where you set it up, you just... Like, if you go for an assassination, just go all in, right? Like, don't worry about your clock if you're playing with a clock. Just line up all the dominoes and get done, because you're probably only going to get one shot to pull off it any real competent assassination versus most opponents because otherwise you're going to be down quite a lot i'd say in general the first thing to appreciate with australia is as as you said earlier it's spread out so there's no full faction coverage at all like the quality the quantity of players i should say we get is quite a bit lower than anything you'd see like you probably have more people in a local game shop than we'd have in a city and you might have multiple local game shops within an area and we only have realistically like six to seven areas in the entire country because of just how like spread out things get and also the lower po- population density the fact the product comes from america so it has to be shipped in you know you generally speaking it's like here play this game of war machine it's great fun and you just give them like a bucket of proxy bases no one's gonna play that <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look great. <laughs> but the the stuff that people do, I maybe it's because of the fact that it's difficult to get things, and a lot of people therefore lean less from the klepto side of just playing a lot of things and maybe badly because there's a lot of good players. So if you just keep showing up with a new army a week, the guy who's basically going to be like, like you're going to run into some idiot like me who's just like a one list tryhard, <laughs> one faction tryhard, and he's going to be like, well. I am going to make this minor change because I want to try it and we're still going to play, but you know, you're trying to play something brand new that you've just bought and here I am with like the same shit I've been playing all this time. So yeah, good luck. (laughs) So it sounds like you have a lot of players that'll like jump between factions, mostly because of physical model availability. Do you find a lot of players will do like stats machine or, or things like that where they'll plan out a lot of things in paper because they can't quite get a game in person? Sometimes. I actually think it's it's less. I think it's a lot of times they'll just show up and they'll like try some stuff out, proxying if they have to, to see what feels fun and good to play and what seems to make the cut. Because a lot of the times, like, yeah, stats machine is one thing, but you've got to put the mo- the models on the table. You need to balance the two. You need that practical experience. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I find a lot of the players who, like, anyone who's jumping in to play War Machine, a lot of the times they will be of the more, like, competitive bent anyway, so that we'll start comparing notes and stuff. Like, realistically, a lot of people will, like, post up and go, how do I make this list more disgusting? (laughs) Please give me notes. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let's talk about some of the future stuff, right? What are you most excited about for Mark IV, from War Machine in general, uh, from things coming up in your community, or just that might come out of Privateer Press? All right, personally speaking... I feel Mark IV isn't released yet, and that's okay. 
especially given all the crap that's been happening in the world recently, just delays and ongoing problems. I'm going to be honest, I'm mostly excited to see a full release version of Mark IV with like way like more armies, more stuff. Getting the scenario pack in line with I think what they kind of want to be pushing for for the next edition of like for this particular edition. That kind of things, that's what I'm keen for. Obviously in Australia it would be remiss of me to say I'm also looking for releases. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, like as the like there's a lot of teething problems I think with my, with well frankly any new edition not necessarily even related to Privateer Press they are still a small company and they do try their damnedest which I can appreciate for but yeah I would like like I have good friends of mine who are basically taking a step back like none of us are going to the WTC this year because we all have real life we basically put a war machine a little on the back burner to focus on basically real life stuff and that's kind of what the thing is like I'd like those guys to come back in with a game that they'd be happy to play and like see and make work and then push my shit in and I'm gonna be like why the fuck did I get these people back in <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to winning it felt so good what happened uh, I, I'm not that used to winning please I'm not like <laughs> <laughs> I still play mortal miniatures it's fine but yeah like that that th like because I love actually I, I had my reservations about Mark IV, especially some of the stuff I saw. I would like to see what they come up with, but, like, the more I've played it, the more I've come to appreciate some of the things they've done, especially appreciating, like, honestly, more the legacy uh, models. Not necessarily because I don't think they did a good job with the Mark IV factions, but because I really appreciate a company that keeps trying to make the old stuff not just like you know just be compatible but feel new and exciting and i'd like to see that going forward in more ways in terms of the game itself i would personally mostly i'm interested in how they're going to expand things like are they going to stick with this idea so far that they're going to stick to one army per list per tournament like i literally had a tournament i was running the other week and one guy dropped out when he found out he couldn't play like gorton with barney too and he was so disappointed, and, I mean, he was coming from a different city, so I can't exactly blame him on that one. Like, he'd have to have a three-and-a-half-hour drive just to get to a tournament. But, yeah, like, that kind of thing would be cool. And it's not like it'd be super ridiculous, because, I mean, you think of, like, War Machine back in the day, like, super ridiculous is part of the course. That's what you're there to... That's what part of the game's oh, appeal yeah, to me. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I would like to see how they do um, expansions because, like, I don't think you can keep going with the idea of, like, you're playing this one thing and one thing only forever because eventually you're going to be in the case of, like, this feels mapped out. It might not actually be, like, a faction is, quote, solved, but it's going to feel like, well, there's, you're stagnant. There's not much you can do. There's no real spice added to it. And I'd like to see how they release schedule plans out. But a lot of this comes down to once they get their production online, I think they start actually hitting their like timetables in a more consistent way. That's when we'll see things. And that's probably when also a lot of people will start coming back as well. And again, like we're in an almost an extended beta test. I can't exactly blame you for wanting a more complete product. I mean, if you were a Hordes player, you literally had to wait until... Well, you still have to technically wait until you want your new shiny. Brian Bloods are nearly out, right? Exactly. They are nearly out. They're not yet out. And they will, when they come out, like, Brian Bloods look pretty damn cool. Admittedly, I, we were terrified briefly for about, like, some crabs attacking you, but that, that's crabs. <laughs> <laughs> crabs are you're scary. You're going crabs. You're going to have a bad time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> God, I'm glad, they, I'm glad they at least fixed that real fast. <laughs> yeah, real quick, yeah. Can't let that release. Oh. When that dropped, I, I think my mouth dropped to the floor, too. No, yeah, it was a little bit like, is this for real? This seems a bit dumb. Yeah. So, um, what would you say you think you would need to see in the game? Like, one new army for every faction in order for you to call it, you know, ready to bring my old friends back in? Probably be two things, honestly. You're right on the first one. One new army per faction, or at least, like, something that someone feels keen to play. Enough variety that players have real choice. Yeah, like, I mean, you looked at the early things when it was just Cardor, Signa, Orgoth, and it was pretty damn good for that, like, initial thing, but it's a very small subset of, like, actual War Machine in terms of both faction diversity and, like, playstyles. I've been quite liking the stuff with Dusk so far. I think some of it probably needs a bit more work, but that's just me. 
and that's just after watching a tournament. But I also think, like, Dusk has a lot of cool tools. What would I say? Yeah, it's maybe more like the expansion stuff and things like that coming out. I know they keep talking about card rays, and we'll see if when what flavor or shape those actually come out in. But that would be nice. I also think, like, I have really fond memories of the erratas they did. I uh, especially the Fey Errata. I mean, that gave me a whole new le- that gave a whole new lease of life to the game. And that's the one from October of 2021, right? Yes, that one. Um, the one that pretty much was a whole game Errata. I think the concept of there, like that kind of idea, it's a lot of work, but I think it really it really stirs the pot and makes things like feel good again or feel fresh, even if you're playing with the same crap that you've been playing for years. So yeah. I think a bit of that, a bit more faction variety, and also probably a bit more of a um, sight going forward as to how the uh, competitive scene will look, especially with the competitive players, obviously, like, that would be nice. I think one thing that's impressed me a lot is the actual models themselves. I think they're actual, yeah, like, just the extra detail that you didn't quite notice, you don't really notice from the pictures, that's been quite impressive. So the more new stuff they come out with, that'd be also better. And I, I will tell you, if I never have to glue another model together, I will be a happy man. <laughs> Assembly was my least favorite part of the hobby. <laughs> uh, I find it therapeutic. And also, yeah, congratulations. You're still going to have to fix stuff when it breaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enjoy that. Unfortunately. Get your, um, you still got to have your paperclip and super glue and your drill pin vice <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, it's still there. With me, the paperclip and the pin vice are all going to be super glued to my fingers, so... <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> all right, well, what do you and your group try to do to, you know, reach out to other nearby community members um, and, like, to help, you know, nudge things in the right direction or, or build out that community that you want to see? Have a regular games night that people can go to and just talk chat that sort of thing that that's usually the two things i find help again it's kind of difficult in certainly in like i live in sydney which is the biggest city and there are sections of there i know there are people who play in like the northern sections of sydney but they might as well be in another state it's that far away that's kind of been the difficulty we've been struggling with but i think just more games and more consistency and a better product that would be what we'd need slash want to get more players in or get older players back in and more events as well that that events are just fun you get people together and you have a tournament you start like talking and stuff it's good fun (laughs) yeah and really just getting a whole day to kind of just get in the in the groove and and enjoy yourselves is uh you know it really attracts people yeah of course good payoff do you think there's anything other groups have done that uh you can pull in for your local area and try and you know incorporate that to draw those people in some more Mm, hard to say i i definitely from my perspective we don't really run nearly enough tournaments but that that's always a tough one to do like i know like we used to drive down to canberra the capital on a semi-regular basis during 2022 because they ran a lot of good tournaments stuff like that's probably what we'd need to do but it's hard to say as well you've got real life commitments and like getting a venue is sometimes a pain in the ass. sure Yeah. yeah i can imagine when you don't have like a standard local game shop to play at, it's probably a challenge to even have like a monthly event. Yeah, exactly. Wow. You also got to have like the level of the number of players. Otherwise, it's like, all right, eight to six people are showing up. The same eight to six people as usual. Yeah, that just feels kind of bad. In some ways it does. But in other ways, those eight to six people are the backbone of your community. And if they keep coming, you'll have a thriving meta before too long. Yeah. You just got to pyramid scheme it up, you know, have (laughs) one of them bring in two of their friends (laughs) before you know it. (laughs) You You heard it it here first. You heard it here first, guys. War Machine community recruitment. Take lessons from pyramid schemers everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I I think that's an excellent way to end this segment. So. I'm going to play us out here. So thanks a lot, Chris, for uh, joining me today. And, My pleasure. And um, for, for joining us on our podcast. Is there anything you want to share with us before we get out of here? You know, a, a, Any projects you're working on for your podcast or, or where we can find you guys online? Uh, I mean, you can find us online at Muse on Mini still. And we post uh, like the podcast itself on Facebook. Uh, you can me personally and us like uh, we've all we've got some like family stuff going on uh, <laughs> moving state for actual reference so I don't actually have anything really to report because right now I'm trying to put in boxes including a bunch of minis now that I don't have a tournament uh, to run 
Uh, I would plug a I would plug an Australian event called the OTC, except that I ran it last week. So there you go. <laughs> but yeah, well, no. Next year. Find uh, out about sure, it next year's <laughs> sure next year's OTC. Not to be confused with the Canadian OTC, because someone who named it way back in the day didn't realize there was an Ontarian team team championship. <laughs> but oh well, so be it. And now we can't okay. go back to ATC because the American team championship took that and like. F- <laughs> <laughs> when did this turn into reserving your domain names oh my god yeah, it kind of did yeah. <laughs> it just feels weird um but yeah i yep. look forward to whatever you guys put out next once you get resettled yep sounds good i mean guess you've just kind of like you know guilt tripped me a bit into making a cast i suppose and we can talk about some <laughs> of the things we've done but yeah well, uh, no. well whenever you make it feel free to throw me under the bus on that one <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty fun. Yeah, all right, guys. Did you know it's time for a pyramid <laughs> scheme? <laughs> oh. Anyhow, Dan, thanks for having me on. <laughs> sure, thanks, Chris. Talk to you later. Casual, Dan. See ya. And with that, that was all the interviews completed. Out of all the different individuals that you talked with, any of them stood out to you? So one thing that I saw that I was common in the people that I interviewed was both, I think both parties said that they wanted to schedule events more regularly and that they thought that doing that could help players come back to their store and help their metas grow. So I think that's a, a telling thing that you know, two different people from different areas around the globe have have come to that same conclusion. It's definitely something that you can do at home to make sure that you're getting the attendance that you want to be getting. And the other thing that really struck me when I interviewed Chris from Australia was it's very difficult to kind of reach out and think about the challenges that other groups face when you are not faced with those same challenges at home. Chris cited a lot of issues due to the geographical separation of all of the different players in Australia. Things are just way too far apart there to have a cohesive group. And thankfully, here on the East Coast of the United States, we don't really deal with that as much as as he does. And, you know, I I didn't even think about how much of an impact that would have until I did this interview with him. So it was eye-opening for me, uh, even asking those questions. So to kind of echo some of the things that Dan said, one commonality that I found with, you know, Matt and his group out of Warsaw is definitely the the community building aspect of Mark IV right now. It really kind of has been sort of a fresh take on everything and a reset across the board when it comes to these groups trying to either uh, start up or reestablish themselves because between the it's kind of a two-punch combo, right, at the end of Mark Three with Mark Four coming in and then COVID right before that. Some other issues that we don't see so much here that you might in, in other locations is a distribution. So it'd be interesting to see lessons learned in the past, how some of these other uh, communities are going to be able to receive product. So overall, everyone's very optimistic. And uh, I just want to say thank you again to everybody who shared uh, their time with us and and, you know, let us know what, what was going on your gaming tables. Yeah, I was going to uh, finish up with that. Uh, just my talk with Ryan. It, it seems across the board that the addition change, like any other addition change, you're going to have mixed feelings where there's excitement or there's going to be disappointment or salt, as he puts it. And I, I think it's unavoidable. But I like the optimism that everybody that I talked to shared where they were saying that, you know, come a year from now when, you know, all the hordes have their releases and, you know, all the War Machine stuff is out and and all the ducks are in a row that I, the the game's going to be in a very, very healthy spot. And the fact that we're moving more towards more appealing looking tables and the models look really, really nice as well. I think all this is going to help in being able to build this game and you know, your local areas, as well as build up the communities and get those old players back and all that other stuff. So any of you have anything else to add or we want to get right into the outro? No, I don't think so. Thanks again to everyone that we had on. It's really great to be able to talk to everybody. Yeah, thank you so much again for everybody for spending your time. And hey, if you're looking to, to come to Nova, we still have tickets that are available. Should be a really good time. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I have. 
Yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for sticking out with this one. I realized it was a really long episode. Really appreciate your time with it and do all the fun stuff. Keep playing your games and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Bye. Later. <laughs>